war against the German people to save the British Empire. Even the formidable Nazi propaganda machine could do little to make Germany's position appear anything but compromised by the beginning of October 1944. For the early part of the war, after Nazi tanks had first stormed into Poland, it appeared that Adolf Hitler was invincible. And as time went on, this was something that the German Führer not only believed, but also took for granted. But ever since the Americans had entered the war to fight for the Allies, after the Japanese bombing of the US naval fleet at Pearl Harbor in December 41, Hitler and his axes of evil had been put under increasing pressure on a global scale. In North Africa, by late in 1942, the Germans had been defeated at the Second Battle of El Alamein, as General Bernard Montgomery and the British Eighth Army had taken on Hitler's desert fox, General Erwin Rommel, and won. Montgomery's determination was equal to anything shown by the Germans to date, as typified on the eve of an earlier battle, when he had destroyed all contingency plans for withdrawal, telling his officers, if we are attacked, then there will be no retreat. We cannot stay here alive, then we will stay here dead. It was this remarkable fighting spirit that was beginning to shine through for the Allies, whether fighting in the European or Pacific theatre of war, that was making all the difference. The tide was fast turning against Hitler. Taking on the might of the Soviet Red Army back in 1941 had also resulted in Adolf Hitler getting more of a fight than he'd bargained for. His plans to defeat Russia quickly and decisively through the summer months before the onset of the bitter Soviet winter were dashed with the invading Germans faced fierce resistance. By February 1943, the German 6th Army had been completely destroyed after the Battle of Stalingrad. And at the Battle of Kursk later in the year, for the first time, the Nazis' devastating blitzkrieg tactics failed. Elsewhere, after the Allies' triumphant progress in North Africa, Operation Husky targeted Sicily, before pushing on to make a bid for mainland Italy. But by this stage in the war, Adolf Hitler's health was deteriorating, along with his military judgment. It's been suggested that he was already suffering from the onset of Parkinson's disease, and the Fuhrer's public appearances became less and less frequent. However, Hitler's position and that of his Axis compatriots was about to face the biggest threat to date as an Allied invasion force set out from the south coast of England to liberate France and start the push for Berlin. D-Day, June 6, 1944, was a major turning point. Had things not gone in the Allies' favour, the outcome of World War II might still have resulted in a Nazi victory. Under the supreme command of General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the beaches of Normandy were targeted giving the Allies a great advantage, as the Germans were expecting any invasion plan to attack Calais from Dover. With the Americans securing the Cherbourg end of the coast, landing on the beaches codenamed Utah and Omaha, the British and Canadian forces came ashore at Gold, Juno, and Sword, pushing Operation Overlord towards Caen. By the end of the first day, 130,000 troops had safely landed, and within a month, more than a million Allied service personnel had taken the fight back to France. Even so, 
the Allies met pockets of German resistance. And despite the success of D-Day, Hitler was not going to give up without a fight. And as the summer of 1944, one of the most unseasonable on record, gave way to autumn, the Allies were all too aware that they still had a long, bitter and very dangerous fight ahead of them. Meanwhile, in the East, the Russians were also playing their part, ruthlessly putting the operation, codenamed Bagration, into action. The aim of Bagration was to push all the German forces from what is today the Republic of Belarus back into Poland, and the results were brutal. Historians have described this operation as one of the bloodiest known to man, but more importantly for the Allies, it has also been described as the most calamitous defeat of all the German armed forces in World War II. The Red Army made rapid progress and soon reached Poland, decimating German army units as they went, inflicting casualties that went beyond 670,000. With Hitler's forces fully stretched after D-Day, there was no chance of bringing in reinforcements. Such devastating German losses to the east in Operation Bagration, combined with those to the west during D-Day and the months after, quickly became a major cause for concern for the German people, and morale dropped to an all-time low. Hitler needed to do something, and fast, to prove that the Nazis were still in control, and he unveiled his secret weapon. The V1 had been in production since the beginning of the war, but it was only now that Hitler unleashed the powerful missile on his enemy. The great advantage of the V1 was the fact that no pilot was required. And once launched, the precise technology would track the target and detonate with deadly accuracy. They were soon christened buzz bombs because of the loud buzzing sound the pulse jet engine made. And people always knew when they were about to explode because after the buzzing stopped, there was an ominous 15 second silence before nearly a ton of explosion was unleashed. Hitler focused the V1s on London where immense damage was caused. The devastation led to the immediate evacuation of all the children in London. But the British were very quick to deflect these attacks. And out of the 2,452 that were launched, the RAF managed to shoot down over a third. Also, a reporting blackout by the British press meant that the Germans had no idea how successful the attacks had been. And although deadly, Hitler's secret weapon had come too late to win him the war. Back in France, a diminishing fuel situation was causing a problem for the Allies. And this stemmed from the lack of deep water ports to ship in supplies. Montgomery, now enjoying the rank of Field Marshal, was busy in the north, planning an advance into Germany from Belgium. But Eisenhower advised him to turn his attention to the port of Antwerp in order to open up a useful shipping harbour which would improve the Allies' overall position. Montgomery, although adored by his men, had a reputation for being difficult to command and went ahead with the advance he had planned using the excuse that Eisenhower's strategy needed a combat supply, which was, at the time, unfeasible. Codenamed Operation Market Garden, Montgomery had pushed forward in late September with short, sharp, concentrated thrusts across the River Rhine. The Rhine was one of the biggest natural barriers that stood between the Allies and Germany 
So Market Garden's biggest goal was to secure the bridges intact, which would allow for a fast advance towards Berlin. The market part of the mission referred to the large-scale airborne attack, which was vital for positioning, and the garden part made reference to the ground troops. For the operation to be a success, these two forces needed to work together in perfect unison. But due to the lack of planning, problems began to arise. Previous operations as large as this took months to strategize and rehearse. But the preparations for Market Garden had been completed in just one week, with no rehearsal and almost no tactical training. Other commanders were concerned about the unpredictable operation. But Montgomery stubbornly stuck to his guns, even when shown photographic evidence of menacing lines of tanks very close to some of the landing areas, which he dismissed as being non-serviceable. Operation Market Garden failed in part because the fuel situation due to the Allies' failure to secure a port meant that the Germans had enough time to bring in reinforcements and consolidate their position. There were some 20,000 Allied casualties by the time Montgomery was forced to withdraw and precious time had been lost. It was now vital that a solution was found for the fuel problem because without a steady supply route, the Western Allies' push for Berlin would be seriously thwarted. Just as Eisenhower had wanted in the first place, the Belgian port of Antwerp was the Allies' next target. But as the bitterly hard-fought Battle of the Schlett got underway, it was far from being an easy task for the Allies. The battle began on the 2nd of October along the Schlett River. Despite the fact that the Germans put up fierce resistance to defend the port, it was eventually secured and immediately brought into service for Allied shipping. The opening up of Antwerp, combined with the successful capture of the major port of Marseille in the south of France, finally put an end to the crippling supply shortage that was threatening the Allies' ever-improving position. The beginning of October also saw the end of the Warsaw Uprising, which is as controversial today as it ever was. The uprising saw Polish nationals fighting to liberate their capital city from the Germans. It was a major part of the Polish Home Army's Operation Tempest, which aimed to free Poland from the Nazis before the Soviets could take control. It was soon clear, however, that Warsaw was too heavily guarded for the Poles fighting alone, giving the Russians the perfect opportunity to settle old scores. After Bagration, the Red Army were less than 10 kilometers away from the struggling Polish Home Army when they were ordered to come to an abrupt halt. The Soviets looked on as the Poles continued to fight a bloody battle for 64 days before finally waving the white flag of surrender. At the heart of the controversy is speculation as to the reasoning behind the Russian leader, Joseph Stalin, failing to come to the aid of the Polish Home Army. Some historians have suggested that Stalin had called the army to a halt so that the Polish home front could be defeated, as they would be opposed to the Soviet regime after the war, while the Russian explanation was that lack of fuel and sheer exhaustion prevented a timely intervention against the Germans. That the Soviets were busy during October is undeniable, and on the 6th, they began the Debrecen Offensive in eastern Hungary. If the Russians could secure the area, it would give them a wide open gateway into Germany from the south. The ferocious attack began with the second Ukrainian front storming past the Hungarian Third Army. But then progress slowed and the Germans were able to build up a strong defensive line. The Soviets treated the civilians of Hungary with utter contempt, 
committing atrocities that made the Hungarian troops fight even more determinedly. And despite being outnumbered along with the Germans, they managed to ensure that the Battle of Debrecen ended with the honours even. But the Axis could not hold the Russians at bay for long. And on the 4th of November, the Red Army managed to secure the Hungarian capital Budapest and the surrounding area. October also saw the liberation of Athens. Greece had been invaded by the Italians in 1940, but managed to fight them off until Hitler reluctantly sent in his men in 1941. And from then until 1944, Greece was an occupied nation under Axis control. However, the exiled Greek government did manage to raise an army, which became very useful to the Allies in the North African and Italian campaigns. At this point in 1944, the Russians were already advancing into Romania and Yugoslavia, and the German forces occupying Greece were strategically withdrawn, as they were in danger of being cut off by the Soviet advance. And when the Western Allies took control after liberating Athens, the Greek government in exile returned just over a week later. However, losing occupied territory wasn't the only thing that Hitler now had to worry about. Paranoia and distrust of the people around him was also a growing issue. And this was not without foundation, because there were a number of assassination attempts made on Hitler's life throughout 1944. But Operation Valkyrie on July the 20th came the closest to succeeding. The attack was carried out by Klaus von Stauffenberg, an officer on Hitler's personal staff who used his privileged position to get close enough to plant a bomb at a meeting the Führer and his highest ranking officials were attending. Von Stauffenberg watched the huge explosion before returning to Berlin to take charge of the next stage of the operation. But the news quickly reached him that Hitler had miraculously survived. It was only a matter of hours before von Stauffenberg was hunted down and executed. But the extensive investigation to find anyone who was involved was only just beginning. The brutality with which the accused were treated knew no bounds. Even some of Hitler's closest associates were implicated in the plot. The most shocking name to appear was undoubtedly that of Erwin Rommel, Hitler's most trusted desert fox who'd fought so hard for the Nazi cause in North Africa. Rommel was then singled out for further distinction, as it became obvious through late 1943 and into 44 that an Allied invasion of France was becoming even more likely, and he was given the task of defending the French coast. When D-Day finally dawned, catching the Germans off guard, Rommel did all that he could to fight back, but fate quickly dealt him another cruel blow. On the 17th of July, an air attack resulted in Rommel's car being bombed and he was hospitalised with serious head injuries. During his military career, Rommel had always been against some elements of the Nazi regime, especially the maltreatment of Jews. And when it came to the investigations after the 20th of July assassination attempt, the Desert Fox came under suspicion. When documents from the coup's headquarters were located, Rommel's name was there, not only as a potential supporter, but also as a possible leader if the assassination and subsequent takeover should prove successful. Even though there was no actual evidence of the conspirators communicating with Rommel, the Nazi inquisitors were on the injured man's case. Unfortunately, 
While Rommel had been recovering in hospital, he'd spoken out about his dissatisfaction with elements of Hitler's regime, and this was counted as positive evidence that he was a traitor to the cause. Head of the Nazi Party Chancellery Martin Bormann was convinced that Rommel was guilty and pressed for the case to be put to the People's Court. But on the 14th of October 1944, Rommel received a visit from two Nazi officers who had a proposition for him to consider. Rommel was, of course, highly respected and a hero of the German people, which is why, no doubt, he was given a choice. The officers informed him that he could either face Bormann and the People's Court, which would also mean the prosecution of his family and staff, or he could take his own life. The latter would mean Rommel received a state funeral, and his family would be given a full pension, and his death would be reported as that of a patriot. Rommel bid his family farewell, and left with the two officers, who just hours later phoned his wife to say that her husband was dead. The German people were told that Rommel had died of a heart attack, and as promised, he was buried with full military honours, with Hitler sending Field Marshal von Rundstedt as his representative. But as Rommel was laid to rest, the first major battle to take place on German soil was well underway at Aachen. The Battle of Aachen began on the 2nd of October with the Germans fighting fiercely to defend their city, which was under attack by the Americans. Ironically, during September, the German commander of the city of Aachen had seen his men were going to be seriously outnumbered, so had offered to surrender to the advancing Americans. Somehow, instead of going to the Allies, the letter of surrender was delivered to Adolf Hitler, and the unfortunate commander was immediately arrested and German reinforcements sent in. Despite the brave fight put up by the Germans, their efforts were in vain, with the Americans having almost 90,000 more soldiers than their enemy, the battle was going to be one-sided to say the least. But because the Germans were on their own territory, they were able to hold their lines for a while, as well as managing to inflict heavy casualties on the Americans before their inevitable defeat. By the time the battle was concluded, as a decisive Allied victory on the 21st of October, the casualties for both sides were in the region of 5,000. But as the Germans also had 5,600 of their men captured, it was a heavy price to pay in a battle that had been a foregone conclusion. October really was a key month, and it wasn't only in Europe that there was heavy fighting. In the Pacific, the Americans were at last beginning to make headway against the Japanese. The battles fought between 1943 and 44 were forcing the Japanese away from the relative security of their South and Central Island bases. When the Japanese had taken control of the Philippines back in 1942, the American commander of the United States force in the Far East was General Douglas MacArthur, and President Roosevelt himself had ordered MacArthur to leave the Philippines where he was based. MacArthur was reluctant to depart, feeling the US Army owed it to the people of the Philippines to stay and fight and even considered resigning his commission to continue on as a private soldier. However, in the end MacArthur followed orders and left for Australia, but not before he vowed to return to see the Philippines liberated. And on the 20th of October 1944, MacArthur and his staff waded knee-deep through the water to march ashore on the Philippine island of Leyte Terre as the American general fulfilled his promise.
The Battle of Leyte Gulf, a body of water to the east of the island, engaged the US and the Imperial Japanese navies and raged between the 23rd and the 26th of October. This was considered by many to have been the largest battle at sea of the Second World War, in fact the whole of naval history, but it can actually be segregated into four major battles. Fleet Admiral William Halsey was in command for the Americans, and his in-depth planning, combined with determined leadership, meant that by the 26th of October, the Allies had secured a decisive victory, despite being subject to the first ever organised kamikaze bombings. The troops now fighting for the island of Leyte would be safe from a sea attack, and although there was still some way to go, the tide in the Pacific was definitely flowing in favour of the USA. Nevertheless, while the outcome in the Pacific was as yet far from certain, the Western Allies were, by this time, beginning to believe that victory in Europe and the end of Hitler's reign of terror was in sight. As the Russian Red Army made swift and brutal progress, the Americans were discovering that fighting the Germans on their home territory was a dangerous business. A prime example was the Battle of Hürtgen Forest, an area that skirted the border between Belgium and Germany. After the immediate shock of D-Day, the Germans had managed to consolidate their position and had built up their defences, which was, at last, slowing down the Allied advance. As the Allies moved into Germany, one of their major goals was to clear all of Hitler's troops from this heavily forested area, which would in turn prevent the Germans from reinforcing their front lines further north, between Aachen and the River Ruhr. The engagement began on the 19th of September and became the longest running battle on German ground in World War II. It was also destined to become the longest battle in US history and as matters would not be concluded until February of 1945, these really were the early stages. For the Germans, this was a vital piece of territory to hold, not least because Hitler was still planning a major comeback with his Ardennes offensive, which would become better known as the Battle of the Bulge. It was to be an important staging area for the many troops, vehicles and armaments required to put the plan into action. The Americans naturally had their own agenda, including taking control of River Ruhr's dam, which could be opened to flood the entire area, something they might either want to do, or more importantly, prevent the Germans from doing. On October the 5th, in a first major phase, the US 9th Infantry Division attacked the town of Schmidt, which was a significant link in the German supply chain. The battle was fierce, with both sides needing to hold their position, and it wasn't until October the 16th that the struggling 9th Division was reinforced. In just 11 days, 4,500 American troops were lost, serving notice that the Germans were far from beaten, and as a result, the Allied reinforcements came thick and fast, capturing Schmidt by November the 3rd. As well as determined German resistance, the terrain was also difficult, with Hürtgen being an extremely dense conifer forest with hardly any roads, restricting vehicle access. 
In the few clearings, the Germans had preset their guns to fire with deadly accuracy, and they'd also been able to plant minefields that were covered by the winter snow of 1944. Equally, the dense forest caused problems for Allied planes, as there could be little air support for the troops below. The terrain became an even bigger problem in the second phase of the attack, as not only was the weather worse, but also tanks became essential in the battle. American engineers did manage to blast tank routes through the battle zone, but it was a perilous exercise. While the battle continued, the weather and fighting conditions deteriorated and many lives were lost simply as a result of frostbite, trench foot and sheer exhaustion. A number of the Americans fighting here had also been involved in the Normandy landings. Some who witnessed the bloody battle for Omaha Beach, where over 3,000 troops were slaughtered, commented that by comparison to the Battle of Hurtgen Forest, Omaha had been a walk in the park. Out of the 120,000 American troops involved at Hurtgen, some 33,000 were killed or incapacitated. And although it resulted in an Allied victory, it was very costly, especially when you consider that German casualties were less than half those suffered by the Americans. As time went on, although the capture of Antwerp and its large port had improved the supply situation, getting fuel through to the Allies was continuing to be problematic. The Nazis were still occupying the surrounding areas, and Walker in Ireland, with its vantage point overlooking the Scheldt estuary, was guarded by the German 15th Army. Field Marshal Montgomery gave instructions that the Scheldt area was to be targeted and Operation Infatuate was put in place with the task of removing the German threat to the Allied fuel supply route given to the 1st Canadian Army. The bombardment of the German defenders began at the end of October, but it wasn't until the 1st of November that the Canadians actually landed on Walker in Ireland. But the Germans continued to put up a fierce fight until slowly but surely the Canadians cleared each section and the final phase began on November the 8th. After days of heavy fighting, some 40,000 German troops from Walker and Ireland and the surrounding area surrendered as the Canadian soldiers completed their mission. By the end of November, the port of Antwerp was fully functioning and the Allies' fuel supplies were no longer in question. Shortly after the Allies' amphibious landings at Walker and Island, other ports were also captured. And as the numbers rose, the stronger the Allied position became. The port of Zeebrugge in northwest Belgium had also been captured by the Allies in early November, marking the complete liberation of the Belgium nation. It was certainly bad news for Hitler and his dreams of a thousand year Reich, but the German Fuhrer was still not ready to give up his dreams of world domination. Once more, he turned his attention to attacking Great Britain as he unleashed the new improved V-2 missile on London. German engineers had been set to work improving the V-1, which had already dealt the people of Britain a terrible blow. However, the V-1 had given a warning of its arrival due to the loud buzzing sound it made and refining the V-2 so that it was silent would improve its effectiveness dramatically. Speed and trajectory were also updated, which made it almost impossible for the V-2 to be shot down by anti-aircraft guns. 
The V2 was the single most expensive project of Hitler's Third Reich, and at 100,000 Reichmarks per rocket, the cost eventually became a problem. But not before Hitler, believing this to be a winning weapon, created 6,048 of these deadly rockets. There was also a tragic human price paid in the production of these weapons, as they were manufactured in factories manned by inmates of the Mittelbau Dora labour camp, and some 20,000 workers lost their lives before Hitler's new V2 was ready to launch. The first V2s were actually fired in August 1944, but it wasn't until mid-November that they really got on target, hitting Britain about eight times a day. When attempts were made to shoot them out the sky, the massive quantities of artillery shells raining down caused more damage than the rocket itself, and an alternative counter-offensive was needed. It was evident that once the V2s had been launched, stopping them in their tracks was nigh on impossible and the British knew that their only hope of destroying the rockets was to do so before they'd even been fired. At first, the RAF attempted to bomb the mobile V2 launch sites, but this proved to be prohibitively costly at a time when conserving valuable resources was of vital importance. The next plan put into operation was to misinform the Germans about the directions in which to launch their weapons. British intelligence worked tirelessly so that false impact reports were sent back and eventually they managed to get the Germans directing the V2 rockets to targets in less populated rural areas. Far from solving the problem, such measures just lessened the impact, and so late in the day, the most successful form of counter-attack had to be the Allied advance towards Berlin, targeting the V2 launch sites as they went, pushing them out of range. But this was going to take some time. And as 1944 drew to a close, the V2s continued to be a very real threat to London and the surrounding areas. Despite the colossal expense of the V2 project and the undeniable success of the attacks on London, Hitler's miracle weapon would make little difference to the outcome of the war. The spirit of the people of London remained optimistic, although the V2s could hit at any time as they attempted to go about their daily business. More than 150 shoppers and staff were killed in a single V2 explosion at a Woolworth store, and in total the V2s claimed the lives of 2,754 British civilians and injured a further 6,500. As a device for punishing his enemies, Hitler's V2s were certainly effective, but when it came to convincing his supporters that the Axis powers could still win the war, despite hitting target after target, the V2s fell short of the mark. It was now obvious that the Third Reich was crumbling, and even Hitler's highest ranking officers were beginning to realize that all hope was lost. But like a wounded animal, the Nazi war machine could still inflict terrible damage and destruction. Hitler was determined to fight on. And as the German position was carefully scrutinised, plans were put in place for one last stand. But it would be a huge undertaking for the remaining troops. They were short of manpower. The Luftwaffe by this stage had been pretty much neutralised by the RAF. And as the Allies' fuel supply improved, the Nazis were left struggling after their Romanian oil fields had been bombed. Hitler knew that he needed to do something big, 
Even as he became daily more irrational, he would have realized that an outright victory was impossible. But he did believe that he could defend Germany in the long term if he neutralized the Western Front in the short term. As had already been proven, the depleted German units were no match for the brutal Russian Red Army, as their numbers were far too great. So Hitler turned his attention to a plan that would split the Allies, highlighting the difficulties they would face negotiating post-war agreements. He especially wanted the Americans and the British to splinter away from the Soviets, and he also believed that the tensions between Montgomery and the American generals could be exploited and used to his advantage. In his desperation, Hitler believed that all he needed to do was buy enough time to produce bigger and more powerful weapons. So plans for a major offensive were drawn up. The military strategists offered many potential operations to Hitler, but only two were put forward for serious consideration. Both targeted the US Army, as Hitler believed that the American public, who'd been reluctant to back Roosevelt's plans to enter the war in the early days, would demand the withdrawal of their husbands and brothers from the European conflict if they were to sustain heavy losses and be defeated in a major battle. The first plan called for a two-pronged attack on the American troops in Aachen, with a further mission to encircle the US 9th and 3rd armies as well. Eventually, it was rejected, as there was little chance of it causing an Anglo-American split. The second plan, however, had far more scope. Using their trademark Blitzkrieg tactics, the Nazi objective was to split up the American and British lines and capture the port of Antwerp, which would not only cut Allied access to supplies, but also trap four complete armies behind German lines. The operation was given the menacing title the Watch on the Rhine, but it was destined to be recorded for posterity as the Battle of the Bulge. In September 1944, the area of attack was discussed in detail. Hitler was insistent upon using the Ardennes as the staging area for the battle. The success here, in the Battle of France in 1940, had been crucial and the Allies were unlikely to suspect a Nazi attack coming from this region as they focused on their own push towards Berlin. Many of Hitler's commanders were against the Watch on the Rhine for a number of different reasons. Some felt that the mountainous terrain was simply too challenging. Others were concerned that if the weather was clear, then the powerful Allied air presence would be able to target the German ground forces with incredible ease. And with the Luftwaffe not able to compete in the skies, the plan would stand little chance of success. Even the commanders put in charge of the operation also had doubts. Field Marshal's Walter Model and Gerd von Rundstedt believed that the additional task of capturing the port of Antwerp was too risky and offered an alternative strategy to Hitler, but he insisted that the battle plans go ahead unaltered. The Watch on the Rhine called for 45 divisions with extra units to form a defensive line once battle had commenced. With the manpower shortage the German army was suffering, they could only muster up 30 divisions, and this really was calling upon their last reserves. Full divisions of war veterans and young recruits were grouped together that if matters hadn't been so desperate, would have been dismissed as unfit for active service. This really was Hitler's last chance to salvage anything from years of fighting and he had no choice but to risk all. <laughs>
the Nazis' diminishing fuel supplies was certainly a hindrance and even pushed back the commencement date from November the 27th to December the 16th. But this was the very latest date possible if the attack on the Americans was to stand any chance of succeeding. Hitler could not afford for there to be any more delays. German intelligence had carefully calculated that the most likely date for a Soviet attack to open up the road to Berlin would be December the 20th. The watch on the Rhine had to have started before this date because Hitler was banking upon Stalin stalling his advance in order to see what the outcome would be if the Americans were attacked. It had been some time since the fates had smiled upon the Germans and for this operation to go their way, luck would need to play its part. To begin with, the thick fog that blanketed the war zone was very good news for the Germans, as it meant that the Allies' air support could play little part in the battle. Also, the Germans managed to keep their plans highly secret, and the element of surprise would definitely give them a major advantage. The Americans, without doubt, had superior manpower. So, it was vital if the Germans were to stand any chance at all for the attack to come as a complete surprise. Since von Stauffenberg's assassination attempt on Hitler's life had nearly succeeded back in July, security had been tightened. But matters concerning the Ardennes offensive were tracked and controlled to prevent any information whatsoever being leaked to the enemy. Helpfully for the Germans, the French resistance didn't stretch as far as the Ardennes, which meant that the Allies couldn't rely on their local knowledge to pick up what was going on, and German radio traffic was kept to an absolute minimum. Instead, telephones, Telegraphs and teleprinters were used by commanders to organize maneuvers and communications, which meant that one of the Allies' most valuable assets to date, Ultra, which usually intercepted all German operations, became almost useless. The Germans also employed similar tactics to those used by Eisenhower when he'd been planning Operation Overlord with all movements that were linked to the Ardennes offensive carried out at night under a blanket of darkness. However, despite the lengths that the commanders went to, word did reach Allied intelligence of a possible large-scale German offensive operation. But the Allies couldn't see how such a course of action would be possible for the almost vanquished Nazis and the warnings were ignored as they pursued their own agenda, pushing ever closer to Berlin. As a consequence, there was little aerial reconnaissance undertaken by the Allies, and Hitler's master plan quite literally went unnoticed. Beginning at around 5 a.m. on the 16th of December, a devastating bombardment on unsuspecting US troops based in the Ardennes was launched. All the Nazi divisions scheduled to join the attack followed on, and by 8 a.m. the battle was well underway. The thick fog that had set in the night before really helped the Germans, making an Allied air response unfeasible. But as conditions worsened, the fog proved less advantageous, as the attacking troops were forced to go at a much slower pace than had been hoped for. With the advantage of surprise, even with very limited troop numbers, the German divisions managed to encircle two American regiments in a pincer movement and force them to surrender. All around the fighting intensified and the violent battle continued as the weather got increasingly worse. The German advance slowed yet further everything started to fall behind schedule 
And as the Americans were now all too aware of what was happening, while retreating, they blew up bridges and fuel dumps along the way, which slowed the Germans' progress even more. For the Germans, anger and frustration resulted in the captured Americans being treated with utter contempt. Bloody massacres became commonplace, as Hitler issued orders for his troops to fight the battle with brutality, in order to scare their opponent. And even though the end of the war was in sight, thousands of Americans would be slaughtered in the Ardennes. Just a day after the operation commenced, the Germans captured a US fuel station near the city of Malmedy, and as they moved off, they encountered a small group of American soldiers, who after a brief battle, surrendered. These troops, along with the POWs from the fuel station, were herded into a field and shot, a cowardly and gratuitous act of violence with no advantage gained by the Germans whatsoever. This futile act of brutality was eventually treated as a war crime, and the Malmedy Massacre, as it became known, was tried on the 16th of May 1946, and the commander responsible for ordering the atrocity was sentenced to death by hanging, along with 42 other members of his division. What's more, the occurrence of the Malmedy and similar massacres in the last weeks of 1944 did have a negative impact on the perpetrators. As news reached the Americans fighting throughout the Ardennes, they became more determined than ever to withstand the German attack. A case in point was when the Germans managed to encircle the Americans in Bastogne. Brigadier General McAuliffe, the US troops commander, received a letter from the Germans demanding an immediate surrender. To the United States Army commander of the encircled town of Piston, the fortune of war is changing. There's only one possibility of saving your encircled troops from total annihilation. That is the honorable surrender of this town. If you reject our proposal, six battalions are ready to annihilate you and your troops. All the serious civilian losses would not correspond with the well-known American humanity. What is your answer? Nuts. McAuliffe's one-word reply, nuts, went down in history. And although the Battle of Bastogne raged on, Hitler's dream of a famous last stand that would at the very least salvage some Nazi pride began to fade. The outcome of the Battle of the Bulge would not be decided in 1944, and as the fighting continued through Christmas and into the New Year, the casualty figures for both sides continued to rise. 1945 was destined to bring peace to the world, shattered by war. But as the push for Berlin and Hitler's ultimate defeat continued, the days of Roosevelt, Churchill and Stalin working together as allies were beginning to draw to an inevitable close.